uh, for those that haven't seen, the attendance sheet is in the chat. Um, and as I haven't heard, I'm slightly losing my voice right now. So I'm gonna try and keep introductions to a minimum. But um, hi everyone, welcome back to EGS. Uh, this week we have two guest speakers, uh, one of them who's here right now, Chris McColl, and one of them who will be arriving later, Danielle uh, Vuono. Tom, Chris, you know how to say her name better than I do. Is it Vuono? I think that's how I say it. <laughs> All right, good. <laughs> but yeah, so I guess I'll give Chris a brief introduction. Um, he is the lead programmer at Gossamer Games, currently working with EGS on some research projects and has also worked on EGS projects in the past, such as Soul. Uh, Gossamer Games is actually a studio that came out of EGS. And so they've kind of just hung around a lot, working on things here and then working on things for other studios like Okta um, and other places like that. Uh, so he's come today to talk a bit about uh, optimization in game engines, such as like Unity, as well as one of the projects he's been working on, SimPHL, which is for EGS, uh, and how he's optimized that to kind of uh, make it more accessible in WebGL um, and other like similar low-end engines. But yeah, Chris, if you want to just take it away, you should have the ability to show your screen. I am checking now. Yes, there it is. It. Cool. Um, give me just one second. All right. Yeah. So I'm going to also introduce myself. Uh, as um, AJ said, I'm Chris. I graduated from Drexel last year, right? Yeah. Uh, with from Drexel from the CS department, and I had a math minor. Uh, so I joined EGS in like 2017, and that's when I started working with. Tom and Nina at Gossamer Games, and then Danielle also joined the speaker later today. And then we worked on Soul. So I have like a couple clips that I'm not trying to share audio or anything, but just give you an idea. We worked on Soul, uh, which we released on Steam and Xbox One back in October 2019. So almost the two year anniversary. And it was like nominated as a best student game at IGF that year. Uh, and then for senior project, I worked on Resilience, a city builder game uh, that's civically engaged um, based on refugees and managing refugee camps uh, on this alien planet and interacting with diplomats and so on. Uh, then after graduating, got back to Gossamer and we worked on Code Tycoon uh, with Okta, as AJ had just said. So this actually released in May and is a browser game that you can play for free. So this is really cool uh, that we just got like our first like really large client that was outside of the EGS, which was cool. And then now we're working on our next game, uh, Halloween Hero, which is basically a game where you play as a dog at Halloween time. And that's about it. So that's where we're at now. So I'm going to be talking to you about optimization. So basically, I'll first want to explain what optimization is. Uh, and basically, it can be summed up as iterating over an aspect of development to make it better over time. So you can optimize your workflow, meaning like you create tools that help you get things done, what you need to do quickly, or you get rid of some things that take a long time manually. Uh, an example of this is I actually just released my first Unity asset uh, called Easy Dialog. So that's like on the asset store now. Uh, and it basically is exactly that. It's a tool to help you manage and play and sort through dialog and you know structure it well in a game. So making tools like that to help you make your games and work on your process. And then you can optimize your art assets. So that could be either cleaning up topology, maybe lowering the poly count to make sure it renders faster, um, maybe crunching down textures to be lower pixel count, um, lots of other things. It could just be even making your own personal things in uh, Blender or Maya to make sure that you can animate your characters better, creating like different handles and things. And then the kind of optimization that I'll be talking about mostly. And what most people are probably meaning when they're talking about optimization is code optimization. 
So basically, uh, games have to run at at least 30 frames a second, which is 33 milliseconds per frame. And if you want to do 60 frames per second, that's 16 milliseconds per frame. And so you really just want code that runs fast. And if it's a memory constrained platform, so it doesn't have much RAM, uh, like a phone or a Nintendo Switch, you might also be concerned about the memory that you're using. So you might also be optimizing to decrease your memory footprint. So now I'll talk to you about sort of how you'd go about optimizing your code uh, or art assets or whatever. And really the first thing you need to do is not optimize your code. Um, optimizing right off the bat is sort of something that I always learned in Drexel. And I always thought it was weird until I actually started optimizing myself. And the reason that they say this is because you don't really know what you're developing and you don't know what's going to be taking a long time or what you're even going to need to optimize. So the idea that you're going to be optimizing right off the bat with nothing to go on at these early stages is not really beneficial. Um, I especially like the idea uh, that Casey Mutori from Handmade Hero talks about, which is sort of development by exploration. So I have a graphic I made here that sort of represents that. Um, he basically describes the development or like the programming of a um, of a project as sort of this graphical representation where you start at a point and you have this big blob of an idea of what you want to make. And anywhere inside this blob would be fine as like the end product that you could ship with. You just need to figure out how you're going to navigate there. So maybe you try this thing, and then you try this other thing, and you try this, and you sort of look at all of the sort of explorations that you made, and you pick whatever thing you think best fits your game, and you go with it. And then from that point, you do the same. You sort of explore, and then you pick the point that best fits it. So you're always trying to work towards this idea and not tr stray too far away. You might do something that's sort of not really related to the idea, but you're still making progress, or you might even backtrack, but you're always trying to work towards this. And so basically, if you're optimizing these dead branches, you would be optimizing all of the stuff that's pretty much useless because you got rid of it and aren't even using it in your game, uh, because all you're using are these final little branches. So you more so want to build out pieces sort of lock in what you want, and then you can optimize a branch. But don't start by trying to optimize everything. Um, so once you have these pieces that you know you want to optimize, um, you're not going to just start going through the code and trying to figure out what is wrong with it, sort of just by intuition. You're going to want actual data to tell you what's running slowest. So in Unity, you could use something like the Profiler tool. And this sort of breaks down all of your function calls and what's taking time, what's generating uh, garbage, how many times the function's being called. Um, and if you're using a different engine, they'll have something similar to this. And even if you don't, you could build your own profiling tools or at least set up timers to sort of time how long functions are taking that you, you know, expect a certain level from. Another thing that Profiling is really good to do is uh, you can also just determine whether your CPU is taking too much time or if your GPU is. Um, if your CPU is taking five milliseconds, it's not really going to be that useful to optimize if your graphics are taking 60 milliseconds. You're going to have to optimize the graphics. So doing this sort of profiling is incredibly beneficial to actually figuring out what the state of your program's at. And so once you do that analysis, you're going to want to tackle the worst thing first. Um, I think there's a saying that something like 20% of the code accounts for like 80% of the performance impacts. So basically, if you work on only that thing that's like making your program run the slowest, you can 
sort of get in front of it and try and knock out that one thing and it'll improve your game a lot. Another thing to sort of note is that optimization is not simple and it's not like a generic solution. If you're familiar with the no free lunch theorem, it definitely is uh, sort of, um, I don't know, it also follows that. So you're gonna need to sort of think outside of the box or think about different ways to solve the same problems because solving a problem, making sure it's functional is the first step, but then making sure it can run fast is not always so obvious. Um, and so a lot of people always talk about like reinventing the wheel, um, whether it's an engine, like why would I make my own engine because I have Unity or whatever, or like why would I, you know, make my own function that like C sharp already provides a function that does this. Um, but don't like let that dissuade you from also making your own versions of these things, um, because. Like I said, there's not a generic solution for optimization. And a lot of these pre-made solutions are never really the perfect solution. Everything's going to need something custom if you want it to really fit your problem. So an example of this was that um, working on SimPHL, we had a project, like a file that was like three point something million lines. And I had to split it in a frame. and WebGL was running out of memory, uh, trying to split it because it was, you know, trying to make 3.5 million arrays. So I had to make my own split function to split the lines and use memory that I had already pre-allocated. And that was more in line with what I needed, even though the normal split function probably works for most people. And it fixed my problem where it was crashing the game because it was running out of memory. So another thing to try and do when you're optimizing is think data-driven as opposed to object-oriented. This is something I've been getting more into lately. I've been looking to people like Mike Acton and sort of learning new methodologies and sort of learning more about C and C++ and trying to apply that into my C Sharp. If you don't know a lot about data, oriented programming. I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a second, so don't worry. Uh, so now I'm going to talk about like a sim PHL optimization example. So first, I'm just going to show you what the project is. So basically, EGS and Gossamer is working on a grant funded project to sort of rebuild Philadelphia inside a game engine or some small section of Philadelphia. So this was an early prototype from uh, December, where we had the Rittenhouse Square area in this little square there. And then maybe like 500 to 1,000 buildings around it where we could click on them, get the building data. We could visualize the zones of each of the buildings, and we could rezone buildings. So this is sort of like the prototype that we had that was working. And then what we needed to do uh, was we wanted to show the effects of uh, gentrification. And you really just can't show or express those things in that small of an area of the city, um, because this is really small. What we really wanted was about 18,000 buildings. Um, and so when we had finally gotten that inside of Unity, with no code running in the project, I think it was running at around like less than 12 frames per second in the editor. And this needed to run on WebGL or the web browser, which is a pretty like performance limited platform. So we basically knew that we had a lot of optimization to do and that we could not use the system that we had used to build this inside of the browser. We had to do something different if we wanted 18,000 buildings. And because we had no code, it was pretty easy to see that the problem was really just the number of game objects in the scene. There's 18,000 of them, each rendering a different mesh. And so we quickly did a test where we had everything in one game object with one mesh, so one model that represented the whole city. And so it was taking 
about 0.4 to 0.5 milliseconds per frame. So we're getting about 2,000 frames a second. So that was just the first part, uh, because going from this that we just had to one mesh is a huge difference, because we needed to completely change everything about how we were building and interacting with the game. So because we couldn't use game objects, we had to develop some solution to represent the 3D buildings in space in just code in like C Sharp. We had to figure out where to place these fake buildings so that they would line up with the model in the world. We had to tie the models like visual representation of the building with the code version. And because we weren't using game objects, we couldn't use Unity generic functions like the Unity Raycast. So things like clicking on a building would all have to be made custom. Um, things like painting the buildings would all have to be custom. And also mentioning the painting, because all of this is one mesh, uh, we couldn't just say this building should be rendered blue uh, because there is no such thing as one building. It's all just one big city. So we had to come up with our own custom solution there as well to sort of tie vertex colors to pixel positions in a texture that had like hidden information encoded into the color values that was then mapped into the fake buildings so that we could, you know, on the fake buildings, say you're now a commercial building instead of residential. You would update the texture, and then the shader would use the texture to determine how to draw this piece of the mesh. So really complicated. Don't expect you to understand all of that for sure, but just sort of getting into like some of the weird, complicated things that you might have to do to get something to run. Um, at a reasonable frame rate. And after making all of those adjustments, we were able to run this in WebGL at a solid 60 frames per second. And in the editor, we were reaching uh, something like 1,000 frames per second in this example. So just to recap, you should first build and explore and not optimize your code. And then once you have some solid things that you know that you're going to keep, you're going to analyze them. And then you're going to improve the worst issue, see if the performance uh, that you want is met. And if not, just reanalyze and repeat. Um, and just keep doing that until it's optimized. So that was just some you know, general what is optimization. And here is a crazy example. Uh, but there are like some generic tips that I have that aren't necessarily one size fits all, but sort of this probably will work in most cases. Uh, so like I said earlier, if you're a programmer and you're learning object-oriented programming at Drexel, which I'm positive that you are, uh, because that's all I ever learned at Drexel, uh, you should try looking into sort of data-oriented programming or data-driven uh, perspective. And basically, the main difference between that and object-oriented is the differentiation between the functionality and the data. So something like a building, you might think of a building as a base class, and then maybe the commercial building as like a subclass with polymorphism. That is not something that really goes with data-driven programming. You more just have the data, and then you have functionality that operates on this. And the main reason for this um, is one that it inherently leads to better optimization, just because with objects, you have all these different buildings that are all sort of have different structures, different sets of data. You don't really know about it. So all of the data is part like separated in memory. And so for the computer to iterate over every building, it has to jump all around memory and do a bunch of computations, which it's very slow at. It's very good at going linearly straight through. Whereas if it's data-driven and it's all one data structure, 
you can iterate right through linearly, and it's able to do that very quickly. Um, Data-driven also just tends to be more modifiable. Uh, it's more modular. Um, something like when I was developing the ray casting solution, I was able to have a fast one that I wasn't sure if it worked, and then a slow one that I knew definitely worked. I was able to like pick which one I was calling and change it really easily because it wasn't tied to like a function that's specifically in this one class. I could just modify it, change it, swap functions out and able to test really quickly. So along with that, you should be building lots of small tasks and features at a time and sort of testing as you go. Um, also, when I was building the Raycast, because I had to not use vector threes, because that's Unity specific, and I needed to have my own Raycasting solutions, and I wanted to use the burst compiler to run them quickly, I had to make my own uh, vector addition, subtraction, projection, uh, and all of these things. So I'd sort of build a piece and test it, maybe write some code or assertions to check it, write some tools to visualize it, and then lock it down and then move on and build on top of it. And I could plug in new pieces and modularly design this and add on to it. Another thing that's sort of pretty basic is to split work across multiple frames. Something that might not inherently jump out at you as something that you'd benefit from this is um, AI. So in Resilience, we actually had all the AI doing everything on one frame. And it was kind of complicated because the second AI wasn't really able to base any decisions off of what the first one had done because they're sort of executing and there was no frames between their execution. And in the end, we made a refugee manager that would say, all right, the first 10 refugees, do your AI, and then I'll wait a frame. And then the next 10, do your AI. So the 10 through 20 can do it. And then the next frame and so on. Uh, so in any given frame, only 10 AI had to execute their code, which made it faster. And then it also was just easier for refugees 30 and 40 to sort of base their decisions off of everything before them. Another thing that you can do that isn't necessarily something that jumps out at you is to just cache everything that you need. So the more times you have to find something, like a git component, the slower it's going to be. If you save that into a variable at the top or in the function, you'll be able to execute a lot faster. Something that might not be as apparent would be saving something like random values or you square root values. Um, these functions are super expensive. And most of the time, especially for random values, you don't really need something to be purely random. If you save the first 100 random values that you generate from 0 to 1, you could sort of just iterate through that array and pull them off and not have to generate random values. Instead, you can just pull off earlier generated random values from an array. Sometimes you do need pure random values, but most of the time, not really. And I did the same with square root function uh, when I was trying to make lots of agents that were calculating their health and were using a square root. And I always knew the range at which the square root would be, so I could easily cache those into an array. Um, something else that is really useful, especially in SimPHL, is to pre-compute data or values. So we had all these buildings, and we had to tie the real-world Philadelphia data to these geometric buildings. To do that and start would be a huge pain because I'd have to wait for it every time I wanted to play. Uh, and then it would also not be very good for the player because then they also would have to wait. And it would just take a long time. And there's not really any reason for it. There's nothing special that is unique every time you play. So if you just compute everything beforehand and assign all these beforehand, then uh, in the game engine, you can sort of start knowing everything. 
Another really simple thing to do is to use a better compiler or turn compiler optimizations on or strip libraries that you don't need. Uh, especially in Unity, Unity does not recommend shipping a game using the mono compiler. Um, it's just bad. It doesn't work as well, and it runs much more poorly. So switching to the IL2CPP compiler uh, could give you some potential performance boosts, um, as well as just being a more stable compiler. Uh, another simple thing that you could do is to create everything up front. So sort of memory allocation and deallocation in games is sort of what takes the most time. If you need to make a bullet every time that you want to shoot it, that's not going to be nearly as efficient as sort of having all the bullets off to a side and then just sort of moving them once you actually need them. So that's called like object pooling. Uh, or just like memory allocation up front. A lot of AAA studios allocate all their memory up front, and then they never actually make new memory during the course of their game. That's also because when you're making new memory all the time, you don't really know how much you're using. So if you have a platform that has four gigabytes of RAM, and you don't really know how much you're making new stuff, you might use 4.1 gigs of RAM by accident and run out and crash the game. So by having an allocated heap up front, um, they can sort of ensure that they'll be able to ship on a game, on a platform. And it is always uh, faster. Um, and sort of like I was saying with the refugees, uh, we had a refugee manager that was telling all the refugees how to run their AI. Imagine if we had that where every refugee had to manage itself and know when to run its AI. It would be much harder to run every batch of 10 refugees when they all only know about themselves. And also, then each refugee has to get updated and think about all of the, and then every refugee has to think about which refugees have been updated as opposed to one manager who knows about which ones have been updated and can easily say which next uh, set should run their AI. So yeah, that was a lot of stuff. Um, but thank you for listening to my talk. Um, I could probably put this presentation somewhere in EGS. But if you have any questions, you can hit me up in Discord uh, or on Twitter at underscore sir underscore real. Uh, or email me. So thank you. <laughs> thank you so much. Um, feel free to ask uh, Chris any questions you have about coding or programming or anything you spoke about today. I'll ask Chris a question. Thank you, Doug. <laughs> hey, Chris. Uh, what is the most satisfying thing that you've worked on optimizing? Definitely sim PHL. <laughs> nice. Um, yeah, because I got to sort of get really deep and sort of, it was almost like extending or making like a subset of an engine or something. So it was really low level, which I thought was fun. Um, I really like low level stuff. So yeah, that was the most exciting for sure. Oh, we have one question for you from uh, from Lewis. What would you say is the simplest mistake you see that can be fixed when optimizing? Is there one? That's in the chat if you want to read it for Lewis. yourself. Yeah, thank you. Probably, I see this a lot, uh, at least in Unity, is like there will be a for loop. And inside the for loop, you're doing something that you could have done before it. So like in the for loop, you're always going to comp like compute like, uh, I don't even know. Let me try and think of an example. Like you're setting, like you're trying to set something. So in the for loop, you're computing this value every time, even though it's the same every time. And you could have just done it beforehand. 
or there's like an if conditional that you could have done or like the worst would be if you're doing get component in children or of type or like get component in a for loop because uh, that runs really slowly and you could have done it at the top of the for loop so it only gets executed one time as opposed to if the for loops like 30 items and it does it 30 times so 